The fact is, our actions as humans don't always have to have a negative impact on our environment. With regenerative agriculture, we're building systems that improve steadily over time and follow the way nature was designed to operate. This passive solar greenhouse is a part of a much bigger picture of regeneration here at Fifth World. We are implementing a design that is going to allow this entire 160 acres to operate holistically using gardens, greenhouses, livestock, and water systems. Today, I want to explain what is regenerative agriculture? What is regeneration going to look like here at Morningside? And how can you apply different principles on your own land? I hope you come away from this video knowing that regenerative agriculture isn't just for certain people. It's something that anyone can apply. So let's get into it. I'm sure if you've searched for this video, you know what regenerative agriculture is. However, for those who don't, let me give you a brief refresher. Conventional agriculture operates on the idea that we as humans need to shape and change the land from what it currently is in order to fit our needs. Regenerative agriculture is looking to see what the land is already doing and seeing how we can work with it on an ecosystem level. The land knows how to heal itself and by partnering with nature, we are able to build resilient and anti-fragile ecosystems. The focus then turns to the improvement of soil health through practices like cover cropping, crop rotation, and reduced tillage. We also emphasize biodiverse ecosystems through strategically introducing plants and animal species. It's also important for us to understand our relationship with natural resources such as water and sunlight. And then we go about building systems that allow food to be produced year round with minimal energy. At Morningside, we are building out a main garden, which will have our central growing areas surrounded by a food forest and shelter belt. This site is literally in one of the windiest places in all of BC. So when we look at this 13 acre homestead design, we see that it's surrounded by a hundred foot wide shelter belt. Even that isn't gonna keep the wind out of our gardens. And we know that in highly windy places, our vegetables don't grow. You can see on the screen here that this perimeter is a wildlife fence. That's an eight foot tall fence that's going to enclose and keep this entire garden, shelter belt and food forest safe from wildlife. Within that, the darker green area around the outside is the food forest and the shelter belt. What that's going to do is create a really nice sheltered microclimate inside the vegetable growing area. So that in this very harsh, very dry, wind-stricken environment, we're gonna be able to grow incredible vegetable gardens. The other benefits that come of the integration of the shelter belt and the food forest here is that we're creating what's called a sun trap. So as sun enters the space, it's gonna reflect off of this northern large greenhouse and the, the food forest plants and be focused back in and captured inside this vegetable garden. Inside this main garden, the diversity of plants from the perennials that will be in the food forest and shelter belt, which is this dark green area surrounding the interior zones, is going to create a perfect environment to attract beneficial birds and insects into this garden. It's also going to create a sheltered microclimate, which will mean that there will be less wind and more warmth and more humidity that sticks around in this very windy environment. The main garden, food forest and shelter belt is a part of a larger integrated whole here at Morningside. The next piece to talk about is the integrated livestock system. Here we all have chickens, pigs, ducks and milk cows. It's very strategically placed next to the main garden so that especially the chickens and the ducks will be allowed seasonal access into both the food forest, shelter belt and the vegetable gardens and that we'll also be able to harvest the manure from these corrals and easily use it to amend the soils in the gardens. And the story keeps going. As we zoom out we see that there's a lot more happening on this property. The light green areas are the pastures and the dark green lines that run through them are called silvopasture plantings. What that means is a row of trees and in this case they will be nitrogen fixing trees that will increase the fertility of the pastures as well as produce edible seed pods that some of the livestock here will be able to eat. Another major thing is how we're regenerating water systems here. Getting water and storing water in the ground as well as for use in irrigation has always been an issue. We've installed over four kilometers of swales onto this property. Now, before the swales were here, water used to flow down the drainages and leave, providing little to no benefit. Now, the water that comes onto this property is slowed down, spread out, 
and sunk into the ground. Another way that we're regenerating the water systems here at Morningside is through reintroducing riparian plant species. Now, for those of you who don't know what riparian is, it's basically zones that are close to water. So in here, in this area, you can see this light blue zone, which represents where an old creek used to flow. It's now dry and barren because of historical land use practices. What we're doing is bringing back that water flow through a number of different strategies. Our plan is to plant this out with native plant species and turn this into a lush and thriving creek in the years to come. Land regeneration is all about finding ways to integrate the different systems and elements that are present on a property. Let me give you some examples of how we're doing that at Morningside. On almost every property, we start by fixing the water cycle. Here we are up in the swale. Now, this is one of the most important pieces of the water harvesting system and the entire regenerative property design here at Morningside. This swale is gonna catch all the overland flow, mostly from spring snow melts and large rain events. And as it fills up, we'll channel the water all the way down this path to fill a 700,000 gallon pond. That pond has a gravity powered water line that feeds down to the house, will provide fire suppression in the case of an emergency, but will also provide all the water that we need for irrigating our gardens, our livestock, as well as our shelter belts. This is also a tree growing system. The reason why we wanna grow trees here, well, one, you can feel and hear probably is the wind. This site is so windy and animals need shelter from the wind in order to thrive. So as the water fills up in this swale, Actually, most of it isn't gonna go into the pond. Most of it's gonna sink into the ground and will be absorbed by future trees and shrubs that are planted here. These trees and shrubs are gonna provide fertility into the pastures surrounding them. They're gonna provide food for the livestock, shelter, and they're also gonna create shade, which is gonna enhance the soil microbiology on this site. Now, the scale of this project may seem huge, but I wanna chat through some of the ways that you can apply what we're doing on our farm to your property by analyzing some of the key property factors. The first thing that we look at when we approach any new property is geography. And one of the most important aspects of geography is a thing called a contour map. Now, contours are places of even elevation, so the same height across the entire property. They really give us a, a, a large degree of information about what's going on on the property. Particularly, we pull out the ridges and the valleys. Now, the ridges are gonna be the least hospitable places. They're gonna be dry, exposed, windy, whereas in the valleys, they're basically the opposite. That's often where you see life thriving and water gathering. Next piece we look at in geography is aspect. Also very important. Right now, where we're standing, is a west-facing aspect. This means that this is gonna be the hottest place on the property. So when the air is already very warm and that hot beating westerly sun is coming down, this face of land is absorbing that. Whereas an east-facing aspect is gonna be cooler and more moist and frankly, a bit more hospitable. By looking at your own land and some of these pieces of geography, you can figure out where you might place certain elements and where you might be able to harvest the most water for something like a pond in order to provide yourself with passive irrigation. The next thing we wanna do is take a look at climate. So this means analyzing things like temperature patterns, precipitation patterns, and wind patterns. Now, depending on where you are, your strategies are gonna be different, but a really good approach, no matter where you are, is to figure out what's your weakest link. For us, it's debatable because it's hot, it's dry, and it's windy. When we're making our assessment about which climatic factor we want to address first, what we often find is that key strategies will address many of our weak links all at once. So in our case, we're looking at a lot of shelter belts. We have a 100 foot wide shelter belt that surrounds the entire 13 acre homestead area. We have silvopasture plantings that break up all the pastures and provide even more texture that's going to slow down the flow of the wind. And then again, we have a final layer of a shelter belt inside our main garden. That's in the form of the food forest. The last thing we're going to talk about today is water. Now, pretty much wherever you live, it's a good idea to have a diversity and an abundance of water sources. 
It's especially so in a semi-arid desert like where we are here in Morningside. So what I'm standing beside right now is a 30 foot deep culvert well that taps into a natural spring we observed on this property. There's a pump down here that ties this into the broader property water system, which is also pulling water from the well, as well as the pond and swales that we visited upstream. So what can you do on your property? Well, observe your property, see where water is naturally eroding, causing problems, leaving your property, and where it settles and sinks into the ground. And you can use strategies like swales, ponds, and many others to create your water abundance too. I hope that was an interesting and informative video. We're going to be creating more content about our greenhouses and other regenerative practices and engineering solutions we're implementing from our years of research and development. Get in touch if you have any questions and check out Fifth World.